yeah we are in module 1 and uh, one of the lectures that I really uh, decided to give you is on uh, the use of ultrasound in materials synthesis which is popularly called as sonochemistry and uh, we can always say sonochemistry is a way to realize unusual form of energy in synthesis. As you know interaction of energy with matter brings about chemical reactions. But um, sonochemistry or interaction of ultrasound with matter is not a direct um, <coughs> reaction. In other words, uh, just interaction with uh, any material or matter will not bring forth any useful chemical reaction. But the secondary effect of ultrasound brings about chemical reactions and that is what exactly I want to teach in this uh, lecture. So, uh, this is a unusual form or we uh, traditional chemists will also call this as a unconventional uh, wet chemistry route. There are many wet chemistry routes which can be used for chemical reactions especially material synthesis whereas, uh, sonochemistry is a very peculiar uh, trade off. So, in this uh, talk before I highlight on how uh, the ultrasound can be used for material synthesis, let me uh, at the outset pull out two uh, important persons who pioneered in the field of material synthesis employing exclusively sound waves. They brought about several perceptions uh, on which many themes have been built in material synthesis including our own laboratory we have used extensively uh, ultrasound for variety of materials including alloys, oxides uh, and uh, nanoparticles. <coughs> The first person is uh, Professor uh, Kenneth uh, Seslick from um, the University in USA and uh, we also have Professor Aaron Gedenken from Israel uh, who have really pioneered um, in the area of inorganic solids. <coughs> uh, now when you talk about ultrasound or sono, uh, sonochemical waves immediately that comes to your mind or to everyone is a sonication bath because sonication bath is there almost in every laboratory for some sort of a cleaning purpose. It is uh, almost there in many of the research labs uh, in the medical uh, laboratories and in the chemical uh, laboratories and if you can see there are several uh, versions of uh, sonication bath that has come and uh, this should be there in one corner of the lab almost uh, in every institute. Uh, mainly medical people have used this for sterilization because you can just get all the mucky or dirty stuff which is sticking which is not apparent to your naked eye. So, it is very easy people who are working on thin films they use this for cleaning all their starting materials. So, that the surface of the, lay, uh, the substrate in which they are trying to deposit it is all clean. So, several uh, versions of it is there and these are all easily affordable. It starts from range of 5000 to uh, 1 lakh rupees you can just have any sort of versions of this uh, sonication bath. But precisely I am showing this because this is not what I am talking about. This is not the uh, ultrasound application that I am going to talk about. In fact, I am going uh, a one step higher taking to another realm where we can play a costly uh, chemical activity to realize uh, high temperature compounds. When we talk about sound, uh, we should know that uh, ultrasound is not friendly to ears and it is not uh, always good. Therefore, first we should understand what is uh, what can be perceived by the human uh, ear human ear can take from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz that is 20 kilohertz more than this it is not possible. Therefore, when you talk about uh, uh, low bass notes we are talking about 20 hertz and uh, categorized as infrasound mainly this is uh, something that is responded by elephants we will see that later and then animals and a uh, chemistry we surpass to kilohertz region and when you talk about medical and destructive uh, purposes uh, we are talking somewhere uh, close to uh, megahertz and uh, for real diagnostic purposes you are going still for uh, higher uh, <coughs> ultrasound range beyond uh, 
2 megahertz precisely we do it in 3 megahertz. So, um, <coughs> we can achieve several things uh, namely sonar chemistry even for that matter as we saw in the previous slide uh, cleaning purposes all this come around, around the same range uh, of frequency, but the pressure that is associated with this sort of applications vary by orders. For example, you cannot uh, uh, go for anything for material synthesis below um, say 100 kilo Pascal. So, you need to generate very high pressure. So, we are exclusively categorizing sonar chemistry in this uh, frequency range and in this pressure range. Um, then you have also the medical diagnostics uh, island which is forming here and uh, you can see uh, physio uh, uh, therapy or soft tissue based physiotherapies uh, in the low uh, <coughs> pressure ranges. So, we th this is precisely the place where we stand as far as sonar chemistry is concerned and uh, we are talking somewhere in this region where we can think about its usefulness for material synthesis. So, uh, sounds in uh, the range of 20 to 100 kilohertz uh, as you know they are very much used even by um, animals for example, noticeably bats and dolphins. Dolphins uh, use uh, sound waves to communicate whereas, uh, bats uh, send sound waves to eat. Uh, it cannot uh, find its prey unless or until it sends the sound waves and the, the feedback it gets clearly tells whether there is any eatable which is in the near proximity. For example, this cartoon says that sound waves are produced goes and hits a strawberry for that matter and then it reflects back. So, even in the night you can actually get the sound waves then you know at what proximity you have the um, uh, your eatable at hand. So, bats do rely heavily on sound waves to feed themselves whereas, dolphins uh, send sound waves to communicate with each other. So, these are different forms, but uh, let us go one step more to see where we stand and this is another cartoon which tells uh, what we characterize as infrasound and what we characterize as ultrasound. So, we are somewhere in the safe regime where we are um, uh, where our human ears can hold whereas, when we have um, bats they go into ultrasound domain um, bigger animal like uh, elephant. Uh, stay in the infrasound domain. Ultrasounds used in medical imaging typically operate at frequencies way above human hearing about 2 million hertz to 20 million hertz. That is the region where we do the medical imaging and even diagnostic and destructive things. Suppose you want to break some um, stones uh, using ultrasound waves or so you can uh, rely on using uh, very high frequency ultrasound waves. But one of the uh, very important uh, manifestation of ultrasound uh, which really brought the material synthesis to focus is sonoluminescence. Suppose you are going to bubble uh, uh, sound waves in a solution actually if you can stabilize a single bubble or a single domain bubble then you can actually see this bubble luminescing which is called a sonoluminescence. And when sonar this is a typical cartoon of a sonoluminescence this is the titania rod and around this uh, you see a, a bubble which is stabilized which is showing uh, luminescence. So, this actually brought about a series of engineering principles um, uh, around the issue of cavitation. So, if you can stabilize a cavity what is the dynamic of this cavity and what exactly happens within the cavity and outside the cavity and all the chemical reactions that can happen inside is the basis for sonar chemistry. So, we will see this in stages as we go through. Now, to put in place where the sonar chemistry is compared to several other chemical re reactions that we are talking about. This is a good slide to talk the interaction of energy with matter. We are talking about photochemistry in this uh, um, uh, time scale. We are talking uh, about energy, we are talking about time, we are talking about uh, uh, pressure. If you think of uh, pressure induced reactions then the one which stands uh, foremost is uh, piezo, uh, piezo related uh, uh, synthesis. Um, piezoelectric rather. So, in which case you actually uh, achieve very high pressures, but this happens in a time scale of 10 power 6 to 10 power 8 
which is a uh, uh, which a very slow process and then you have this ge geothermal synthesis which is al also a, a very slow process of the order of 10 power 10 to 10 power 12 seconds but the energy per se all these are form falling in the same energy scale uh, 10 power minus 1 uh, ev and uh, that also includes uh, flame photometry to some extent but when you go to plasma which involves a very high energy we are talking uh, somewhere around this time scale but uh, uh, energy scale but those are very fast reactions so to single out uh, between different islands of uh, chemistry we can say that photochemistry and sonochemistry fall in one region where they are happening at 10 power minus 10 to 10 power minus 12 seconds they are all high pressure and high energy induced reactions very fast process very high energy and very high pressure induced reactions therefore these are of fundamental importance for us so sonochemistry is a peculiar island so to say in the material synthesis now what is how, how does it work let me start with some crazy examples because this can tell us uh, what can happen when we start uh, uh, making materials this is a cartoon of nano crystalline Fe nanoparticles nanoparticles and this is a ACM image of a cluster of uh, this nano Fe particles of the range of 10 to 20 nanometer which was first published by Kenneth Seslick and group and um, you can see they are all mono sized and uh, nearly they are amorphous. One of the main ways to identify that they are really nano in form is that they would be mostly x-ray amorphous if they are truly nano and at the same time if they are transition metals which are isolated uh, in nano form then on exposure immediately they will catch fire. These are quick ways to recognize that they are sp uh, certainly in the nano regime. So, this is a cartoon corresponding to nano Fe particles, but uh, sonar chemistry has gone way beyond simple uh, uh, synthesis this is a cartoon that shows you can make mono sized uh, hemoglobin microspheres um, <coughs> by using sonar chemistry and you can see that uh, these are all roughly of the order of 2 na na micron uh, particles where you can make such uh, uniform space uh, spheres and uh, here is another cartoon of uh, zinc powders now if you uh, sonicate zinc powders then you can see this sort of uh, uh, <coughs> welding happens between uh, two zinc particles. So, essentially there is a localized melting um, and high velocity inter particle collisions are happening between two particles that clearly shows what is the sort of energetics that is involved in ultrasound. So, you can study various aspect of the uh, uh, influence of ultrasound on medical synthesis ma or material synthesis. Now, this is another very useful cartoon to drive home the point what exactly the ultrasound can do to surface. Uh, this is a cartoon of nickel powder as you know Rani nickel is a very costly um, catalyst which is used in um, <coughs> uh, organic synthesis. Uh, or dehydrogenation catalyst. So, Rani nickel is a very costly powder at the same time if you take a ordinary nickel metal which is in the shelf and if you take a look at the uh, <coughs> surface of a nickel powder it gives uh, this sort of flowery feature and this is a SEM image of that. Now, you take the same powder and try to sonicate you can see after sonication or exposing it to a slurry of nickel particles now they all look modified in surface and the they seem to have been also broken because both are in the same uh, scale bar so you see that these clusters seemingly are broken and they are polished now what is the influence you see that once you try to sonicate this uh, this ordinary nickel powders and take this powder and do your reactions the reactions are much much more effective and they are nearly comparable to the Rana nickel. 
So, you do not need to go for a very costly rani nickel you can just take a shelf nickel powder and you can do any sort of catalytic reactions just by surface treating this with ultrasound. What it essentially does is it removes all the passivating layers of this nickel whatever it is it could be carbonates hydroxide anything or even the particle size um, can be broken into smaller ranges and these are all nearly uniform therefore, one can say uniform surface polished nickel particles become highly reactive comparable to that of Rani nickel. So, um, you can remove the passivation you can really bring forth a variety of interesting features uh, with the with ultrasound. Now, uh, is that all we can uh, see there uh, we can get lot more clue about what this ultrasound is doing inside uh, the solution. Now, we take uh, just to understand uh, what is the energy parameter that is involved um, take chromium molybdenum and uh, tungsten powders make uh, take it in a, uh, in the form of a slurry may, uh, with some sort of a organic solvent and now try to sonicate it these are the SEM features of uh, the powders before ultrasound and this is after ultrasound. Now, before ultrasound you, you see the these are the features of the metal particles, but after ultrasound you would see all these uh, chromium particles are getting fused and they form a cluster sort of thing with the same scale bar. And same is true for the molybdenum uh, particles they cluster together when you go to tungsten you see there is no change uh, in fact, they remain the same. What does that mean? If you take chromium the melting point is around 2130 Kelvin molybdenum 20 30 90 Kelvin and tungsten is very high 3683 Kelvin. So, if you try to sonicate these nanoparticles you can clearly see some amount of melting and uh, agglomeration that is happening uh, in the case of chromium and molybdenum compared to tungsten. So, one can say roughly in this sort of sonication you can nearly realize very high temperatures to the tune of 3000 Kelvin undoubtedly. Otherwise these nano these particles of chromium and molybdenum will not cluster together. So, this agglomeration essentially says not only we can achieve very high pressures we can also achieve very high temperatures, but where is it all happening? and if such high temperatures are happening what is happening to the container or to the chemical reaction. These are open questions, but we can try to understand all this provided we know what is really happening in the sonochemistry. Now, sound pressure uh, sound waves when they propagate through a liquid lot of things can happen. Now, as you see here we have compression waves and rarefaction waves they the, the, these are the compression waves and then they relax. Uh, rarefaction and then compression and then rarefaction. So, when a bubble is trapped or when there is a sufficient frequency of the sound to, uh, to ripple or to pull apart the solvent molecules. Now, this sort of cavities are formed and once a cavity is formed you have a continuous uh, uh, propagation of sound through the liquid. Therefore, this cavity is now going to grow because of the rarefaction and expansion uh, compression waves you are going to have a, a growth of this uh, particle and as a result um, <coughs> this will grow in size to optimum and beyond a particular point it is supposed to break as we know that cavities has to break at some point of time. So, this is a simple uh, cartoon just to tell you that liquids irradiated with ultrasound can form bubbles these bubbles oscillate growing and in the next slide I will try to show you how this transient cavitation works and what is the origin of uh, sonochemistry here. So, as I told in the previous uh, slide we have the formation of um, cavity and this cavity actually grows uh, in size over several cycles due to the compression and expansion wave and if you see on the y axis you see the bubble radius. So, typically from 20 micron range it actually grows up to nearly 150. Now, when, when it has gone through several cycles there is a particular cycle at which in a single step it will grow to this maxima and this is the uh, optimum bubble size 
where the surface tension of this cavity is at its maximum and when there is another um, compression wave at this point the compression wave will actually push this uh, cavity to collapse and how does it collapse it does not explode whereas it actually implosively collapses. So, you know that most of the cases the uh, uh, bubbles will uh, will rupture, but the explosion uh, it is mostly of a explosive nature, but in this case this is a implosive collapse. So, when there is a implosive collapse you see there is a shock wave that is triggered which results in a local hot spot and what is the radius of this hot spot? Hot spot is of the radius of 150 micron. So, in this what happens? all this has happened in the time scale of say 100 to 400 microseconds. So, it is a fast reaction the bubble growth is dynamic and the implosive collapse is also dynamic at this point when it implosively collapses very high temperatures and very high pressures are released and also it is immediately a rapid quenching technique therefore, whatever pressure is realized whatever temperature is realized it is all felt only for a microsecond. So, whatever reaction that has to happen chemistry wise has to happen in those microsecond time scale. So, these are a fast quenching and high temperature high pressure reactions in the first place. So, the principle or the origin of so, uh, sono chemistry is this transient cavitation that is occurring and this is actually implo, uh, implosively collapsing. Now, to see what sort of a bubble that we are talking about this is a simulated bubble that shows that this is a implosive collapse and also because it is implosive in nature the whole uh, transformation or the thermodynamics that is involved in this cavitation is uh, adiabatic nature. So, all the temperature that is released is confined within the system and therefore, anything that is trapped within the cavity will actually realize the maximum pressure and the temperature effect. So, in this cavity you can try to bring out the fascinating chemistry that you are looking for. So, this is uh, this is the essence of uh, sonar chemistry. Now, cavitation and hot spots can bring about lot of uh, issues or uh, data that are uh, per se very meaningful you see the cavity here and you see a imploding cavity here and the black region is nothing but your uh, uh, bulk liquid that is at ambient temperature. Now, if you actually pro uh, proceed towards the bubble the temperature zone the red one is nothing but your supercritical fluid which can even achieve temperature up to 1900 Kelvin compared to the local areas these are nearly at room temperature. But if you go closer to the cavity then you achieve around 1900 Kelvin and the white space that you see here is nothing but your cavity which is trapped with some gas and the temperature zone is of the order of 3000 to 5000 um, Kelvin and that depends on the nature of the gas that is trapped. <coughs> now, this cavitation became very important mainly because uh, there was a serious flaw during the um, uh, British army exercise. They found that the turbines that they have used were uh, fastly getting corroded and collapsing. So, this was one of the main reason why the issue of cavitation was taken as a engineering problem. Now, here you can see, uh, see here in this cartoon uh, a shiny uh, turbine. Uh, which is uh, being mounted into submarines and uh, other army applications, but here you can see that these turbines have catastrophically failed mainly because of the issue of cavitation. So, what really happens in the cavity? Cavity enhances any sort of reaction uh, to a rates up to a million times and uh, it is believed to be due to small cavities of say approximately 100 microns which implode creating tremendous heat and pressure shock waves and particle acceleration and this process is called as cavitation. So, the key word for sonication is nothing but cavitation and this started gaining attention for organic chemists uh, in the very, uh, very early years because when someone noticed that organic solvents seemingly are uh, responding uh, very much to sonochemical uh, sono waves. 
uh, or ultrasound waves, uh, it was found that probably this could be extended for chemical reaction. So, that was the origin of using um, <coughs> sound waves to chemistry. So, uh, if you look at the solvent and temperature effects more wide the cavity the hotter it becomes upon collapse. So, if you can trigger a larger cavity then you can trigger a, <coughs> a hotter region and it, uh, it collapses rapidly then vapor pressure of the solvent also becomes important lower vapor pressure solvents lead to hotter cavitation, whereas um, higher vapor pressure um, <coughs> solvents do not lead to uh, such hot cavitation, lower temperature solvents faster hotter cavitations. So, these are uh, some thumb rules or guiding principles to realize um, very high temperatures and which are mainly solvent dependent. Now, how cavities are formed uh, in solvents? They are mainly dependent on the tensile strengths of the liquid. So, depending on the tensile strength of different solvent cavities are formed, when negative pressure exceeds tensile strength of liquid cavities are formed. So, there should be a negative pressure during this ultrasound waves, you have a compressive and a rarefaction wave. So, compression and rarefaction wave when you have a negative pressure which is exceeding the tensile strength of the liquid then immediately it results in a cavity and nucleated process without weak points ultrasound could form cavities. You do not need a rusted region or some imperfect region in a solid to create a cavity just based on the tensile strength of the liquid you can create such uh, cavities. Dissolved gases often help for cavities as tensile strength is weakened and every solvent forms cavities not just water. You do not just need water for making cavities any solvent for that matter uh, depending on its tensile strength can form cavities and uh, if you are interested you can look at this paper which gives you all this uh, useful reactions. Now, uh, when you trade back to see when, when it all happened uh, two things happened in year 1927 the first intercontinental flight uh, was uh, initiated yeah, in other words um, trans Atlantic uh, uh, flight was uh, in year 1927 and it was also the beginning of sonar chemistry and it was Loomis uh, who reported the beneficial use of ultrasound to chemistry such as um, uh, you know ever so slightly depressing boiling points increasing the rate of iodine clock reaction expulsions of supersaturated uh, dissolved gases and increasing the rate of hydrolysis of dimethyl sulphate. These were some of the quick results that were coming in those early years where uh, the use of ultrasound was actually highlighted. But as you see here this has nothing to do with the material synthesis, but we are talking about some sort of a kinetic reactions and uh, uh, <coughs> reactions involving uh, solvents. Why it is so uh, special for chemists? Sonar chemistry involves very high energies and pressure in short time scale. So, if you are looking for quick synthesis and uh, issues involving very high pressures, you can resort to sonar chemistry. And uh, you know, complementary to that is your photochemistry, which interacts with uh, chemicals on short time scale at high energies. So, we are actually talking about uh, scaling up of uh, energy. Uh, in material synthesis. So, therefore, this can become useful. Uh, I will take you through few examples uh, of organic uh, synthesis just to give you uh, some background because most of the work uh, has been done in organic synthesis as well um, apart from material synthesis just for continuity sake and also to tell that sono chemistry is not exclusively um, used only for materials. I would like to pinpoint some of the view graphs uh, that were uh, quoted by uh, Professor Colin Hughes and uh, he has also summed up uh, some of the literatures that are available to study the basics of uh, sonar chemistry which I thought is useful for our lecture. Therefore, uh, these are uh, some of the informations uh, that I have taken from uh, Dr. Colin Hughes group and some of the organic uh, synthesis for example, biochemical applications. If you look at acetylation reaction or acyl migration reaction or substitution reaction or 
1, 3 dipole cyclization reaction. Several reactions are listed here and these are for biochemical applications. As you carefully look at this reaction, you could see that most of it are involving metals, uh, metal salts as uh, catalysts and this metal salt based uh, uh, conversion reactions you can see has phenomenal effect when you try to use ultrasound. Without ultrasound you see the yield is very bad and it takes long hours, yield is very bad, takes long days, uh, many days uh, and uh, this reaction is very slow to the order of a week and several days of reaction with almost very less uh, conversion. Whereas, if you look at the sonication 92 percent of conversion 72, 83, 93 percent and all these are falling in the time scale of few minutes. So, several reactions whether it is acetylation, uh, acylation reaction, substitution any sort of reactions whichever is mediated by a catalyst or a metal salt catalyst they have pronounced effect on sonication. So, although the complete mechanism of understanding the conversion is not possible, but there are several clues that we can pick up as much as we have told about the, uh, the dependency of the solvent its tensile strength and its influence on um, the uh, material synthesis. So, uh, in this case we see a pronounced effect and uh, this is another reaction that is quoted it is called a tandem wolf copy reaction uh, which is both attempted without uh, sonar chemistry and without uh, ultrasound. So, if you use sonication in both cases they have used uh, silver oxide as catalyst you can see that there is conversion which is highly selective and with a very good yield if you are using sonication. Whereas, without sonication you seem to have a different product also with a lot of other um, uh, side products therefore, we can say that uh, you can look for uh, name reactions which are highly selective if you are going to use sonication and uh, for more details you are going to look at it because uh, I am not essentially uh, uh, laying uh, emphasis on the organic reactions. So, you can resort to this reference for more clarification and there is another one uh, which is called dramatic reduction in hindered uh, Mitsunobu uh, reaction rate and here again in this case you see a conversion from here to uh, this product involves 7 days whereas, it can be achieved with a uh, lot of selectivity in just 15 minutes time using sonication. And uh, it was also found out that when you use halogenated solvents they are actually more influential than using mineral acids. For example, you take the reaction conversion of uh, these two reactants to the product you if you are going to use toluene whether you use ultrasound or without ultrasound the yield is nearly 3 percent. When you use uh, dichloromethane for example, you can see when you use ultrasound it is highly selective whereas, without that it is very poor, but at the same time it is not due to chlorine atoms if you use uh, mineral acid you see that the reaction almost does not happen at all. So, uh, so what it, what it means is halogenated solvents seemingly have pronounced effect and it has also been proved in several organic reactions that uh, any reaction which is undergoing uh, free radical mechanism have a very pronounced effect um, using ultrasound. Here again you have a barbier reaction uh, for a variety of conversions and uh, one can single out to see if you are going to use uh, sono chemistry almost 100 percent yield or conversion is affected when you use uh, uh, sonication and this is actually reported uh, in JAX. Uh, for people who are interested in such name reactions you can refer to this. And what about uh, Woodward Hoffman reaction conversion uh, say for the cis form converting to this product and transform reacting to, uh, converting to uh, this product these are uh, stereo specific conversions and whether you use light or whether you are going to use uh, uh, heat the conversions are very selective. For example, the conversion of this cis isomer to this product it is very selective only if you use uh, uh, thermal uh, reaction whereas, if you use photo induced reaction it converts to this. So, it is very selective that way similarly for the trans one, but the same thing 
if you use uh, sono chemistry the cis or the trans will give only one stereo specific reaction. So, this is not only uh, site selective this is not only um, um, uh, selective for free radical mechanism you also see that you can get stereo specific products by using sono chemistry. Actually it was Luce who uh, did several studies uh, using solvents and he developed a new interpretation what he said was organic sono chemical reactions uh, by types uh, the one type is heterogeneous reactions were sped up due to mechanical effects of the ultrasound waves as I told you if you use uh, metal catalyst then you have variety of influence um, and uh, faster conversion homogeneous reactions were sped up due to generation of radicals. So, you can just sp uh, uh, single out two issues one is mechanical effect another one due to radicals true sonar chemical reactions are those which involve uh, <coughs> SET type which is uh, uh, enantiomeric uh, uh, type of activities. So, we can see oh, one or two examples of that testing ultrasound with the unknown uh, anionic uh, reactions one such reaction is this known to react purely via anionic mechanism ultrasound have no effect on the rate or yield. And if you look at the switching reaction for example, if you try to conversion of uh, this alcohol using nitric acid with ultrasound you see complete conversion to this uh, switching form whereas, without uh, um, ultrasound you almost uh, see 0 percent conversion on this and with the ultrasound this is not possible whereas, this is possible therefore, reaction to the acid known to proceed through a radical cation reaction reaction to the nitrate ester known to proceed purely via uh, anionic uh, mechanism. So, some of the take home messages as Luce has uh, emphasized uh, as far as organic synthesis is concerned um, ultrasound accelerates reactions due to cavitation this can be due to mechanical effects and due to promotion of uh, cation uh, anionic based reaction. Uh, now, when we come to uh, material synthesis the game is different and the way uh, ultrasound is uh, employed is different which we will see in the next few slides. So, how can we use this uh, ultrasound for making nano materials this cartoon explains the use of ultrasound you take any carbonyl nitrosyl uh, ligands uh, or metal carbonyls or metal nitrosyls in this form uh, and if you can apply ultrasound the first consequence could be preparing a uh, ending up with a metal nanoparticle and this nanoparticle can be taken to different forms. Suppose I am going to use a stabilizer it could be a surfactant or it could be uh, any alkaline uh, solvent uh, alkali solvent you can actually stabilize nano phase metal colloids. So, once you uh, get nano particles you can put a stabilizer and convert it into a colloid where you can essentially stabilize these nano particles in a suspended form or if you are going to bubble this with some sulfur source either elemental sulfur or sodium sulphide or some other sulfur source you can essentially get nano metal sulphides. For example, if you take cobalt and you bubble it with the sulphur in the presence of ultrasound you will get cobalt sulphide. If you take any hydrocarbon and try to trap this then you can get nano phase alloys or carbides. If you are going to use this in ambient condition that is in the absence uh, in the absence of any inert atmosphere like argon or nitrogen in the presence of oxygen you can directly convert that into any metal oxides. And if you are going to take a inorganic support then you can get supported metal catalyst for example, if you want to trap some iron nanoparticles in alumina support or silica support then you use such a inorganic support to get this. Um, metal catalyst. So, just starting with one particular starting material using ultrasound you can play around with a variety of compounds inorganic compounds and <coughs> for a good review you can actually look at this which appeared as early as 1995. Now, this is typically the way 
you can realize a reaction as you are trying to uh, apply uh, ultrasound in a sonicator cell which is uh, which is a typical uh, cartoon that you can see there is a power supply which is uh, going through electrode and there is a horn which is nothing but a piezoelectric horn and this is your titanium rod which is actually uh, mounted or suspended into a, a solvent and uh, this is the sonochemical cell that you can have you can actually keep you can keep uh, sending uh, nitrogen or argon as you desire. Now, once the sound waves comes in for a long time this will actually be trying to scissor the nitrosyl or carbonyl moiety from the metal and after a particular time you would see the solution turning black. The moment the solution turns black you can be sure that the metal nanoparticles are formed. So, typically this conversion would take place um, of the order of say 1 to 3 hours depending on the nature of uh, uh, starting material that you are employing. So, once this is um, uh, formed uh, then you can try to take the whole uh, vessel into a uh, argon uh, glove box and then you can try to carefully filter so, so that this metal nanoparticles can be preserved in inert conditions. One reaction one caution that we need to take during sonar chemistry is you need to actually apply ice bath so that the hot spots which will ultimately keep heating this vessel will be kept at low temperatures otherwise your organic solvent can um, evaporate. So, most of the reactions we can use decalin as a solvent which is uh, preferably used. So, this is a cartoon which tells typically how a sonar chemical uh, synthesis work. Now, uh, when we talk about the sonar chemistry for material synthesis it is two ways it can either be a top down approach or it can be a bottom up approach meaning you can actually use a, sol a solvent and some metal salts in solution and then you can arrive at uh, synthesis of this nanoparticles or you can start with the heterogeneous reaction and you can end up with this same um, regime. So, both ways you can end up with uh, nano uh, materials. Now, I will show some examples of how we can make uh, alloy nanoparticles for example, one of the most important alloys is cobalt platinum alloys which is also used in memory storage devices. So, you can take CO2 CO8 which is nothing but cobalt carbonyl and this cobalt carbonyl if you sonicate for 3 hours in decalin solution you will get cobalt nanoparticles. Similarly, if you take platinum chloride in case of platinum chloride you do not have carbonyl, but uh, you can still use platinum carbonyl and if you can sonicate for 3 hours in N propanol you get platinum nanoparticles. So, if you are looking for cobalt platinum nanoparticles take these two together and sonicate it for 3 hours you can get cobalt platinum nanoparticle and some of the view graphs will tell us what set of uh, <coughs> product we can get. This is a typical transmission electron micrograph of cobalt platinum nanoparticles that are formed. You can see they are making some sort of a heart shaped uh, um, decorations and essentially each one of these small dots are cobalt platinum nanoparticles roughly of the order of 2 to 3 nanometer in size. How do I know that? If you take the selected area diffraction of this particular compound it gives a blurred image which means it is not even polycrystalline is real in amorphous form. So, you do not get any electron diffraction spots, but if you are actually going to focus the same um, uh, TM uh, beam or the electron beam on a particular uh, particle you would see this, but soon after that you would also find that the same region is getting crystallized to a ring pattern. What does this mean? the electron beam is able to crystallize that nanoparticle from amorphous to a crystalline form. So, it is that fine at the same time they are very reactive they can even get crystallized by the interacting electron beam. Therefore, we need to understand this is the sort of uh, reactive particles that we can end up with sonochemistry. Now, 
what is so uh, great about this uh, cobalt platinum nano alloys because cobalt platinum and nano alloys show structural disorder and this can influence the magnetic property or uh, catalytic property to a greater extent. If you take the cobalt platinum amorphous alloys that we have prepared using sono chemical uh, approach you can see the phase transformation that is occurring. If you do the DSE curve for cobalt platinum the first peak what you see here is the glass transition temperature and this amorphous alloy is getting crystallized somewhere around 350 degree C. So, if you want to study this in amorphous form you should always restrict your temperature for treating this particles well below 300. Now, one of the beauty of this uh, DSE curve tells us whether this is a reversible uh, transformation. So, first is the glass transition and then is the crystallization then you see the FCC to FCT conversion and when you reverse it back this FCC to FCT now reverse backs to FCT to F FCC. So, this is a reversible conversion, but once you have crossed through this crystallization temperature on the second run you see that this has become smaller this kind of uh, crystallization and in the reversible you do not see anything. So, the FCC to FCT conversion happens beyond 400 and this is a reversible conversion in the first cycle, but once it is crystallized then you do not see this reversible conversion. So, this is the essential feature for any sort of usage of this cobalt platinum nanoparticle therefore, you have a governing principle there you cannot go beyond 300 uh, Kelvin uh, 300 degree C. So, we can make powder compacts of this cobalt platinum and you can anneal it at 300 to do electrical resistivity measurements and this cartoon tells that the in the XRD for 0 percent um, platinum you are seeing a small signature of a HCP and as you increase the platinum content you almost see a amorphous pattern for the as prepared compounds, but when you heat it at 900 degree C in case of both the cobalt nanoparticle as well as 30 percent platinum nanoparticle you do not see the HCP which is supposed to be the case whereas, you see completely a FCC transformation and that is the beauty of sono chemical reaction because FCC is not possible to be stabilized below 1000 uh, degrees uh, for cobalt platinum alloys. So, when you are heating it at 900 degree C you are able to stabilize a FCC pattern at room temperature which means this is a metastable phase. So, in nano form when you try to prepare uh, compounds you are essentially able to successfully stabilize metastable phases um, for a cobalt platinum series. Not only that you can see that this FCC FCT transformation is occurring as you are uh, going to higher temperature and this 200 and this 220 incidentally these are the peaks of platinum uh, substrate. This is not the uh, system peak this is the platinum substrate peak. So, what you should be watching is the crystallization or the FCC to FC tree transformation which is occurring here as a function of temperature. So, this is this is a high temperature x-ray pattern that we have done for cobalt platinum 50-50 alloy. So, you can see how the crystallization and phase transformation occurs. Now, one of the important thing that I want to uh, drive home in this view graph is uh, what really uh, happens to the electrical property uh, in this sort of uh, materials nano materials. If you do the uh, resistance uh, normalized resistance versus temperature plot you can see uh, systematically the resistance is uh, increasing as you increase with platinum. But what happens in all cases you have a minima which is important uh, from the physics point of view this is exactly due to the local disorder or due to the magnon effect and as a result you have a up curve in the resistivity below this minima. Now, if you look at the T minima T minima that we are talking about and if you try to plot this T minima as a function of platinum concentration you would see only for a 30 percent um, cobalt platinum alloy you see the T minima is more pronounced 
and also the residual resistivity seems to be more pronounced only for 30 percent. As a result if you plot the M R by M S from the hysteresis loop you also see the same trend for the cobalt platinum alloy and as a result the magneto resistance ratio seems to be maximum only for 30 percent platinum doped alloy. So, what do we see from here we can make correlations between magneto resistance and the local disorder uh, in this uh, cobalt platinum nano alloys and we can make several interesting observations as a function of platinum doping. So, one can systematically study what is really the governing factor that controls the properties as you see here all the amorphous alloys show magneto resistance uh, 0, 10, 20, 30, 40 percent, but when you do the magneto resistance at 300 percent you see a positive MR only for 30 percent doped ones whereas, the other ones are showing feeble magneto resistance and this positive MR is due to the local order and also because of the residual resistivity which is higher for the 30 percent case. So, we can bring in interesting conclusions based on the structural property correlations and we can also see that there is a very strong coupling for 10 and 40 percent uh, platinum doped one compared to the 30 percent uh, uh, stuff and therefore, there is a oscillatory dependence of MR that we can notice in this compounds. Another interesting um, alloy is iron platinum nano alloy we can prepare it in amorphous nano uh, form but there are interesting uh, features that we see in iron platinum nano alloys. This is uh, the re resistivity curve for a typical iron platinum nano alloy prepared by sonar chemistry where you can see a crystalline one shows a resistivity curve like this and amorphous curve actually shows uh, the magnetic uh, transition uh, in a peculiar form. Uh, let me uh, bring forth some examples of that before that you can see how the iron platinum nano alloys form a self assembly. As you can see here there are several regions where this sort of clustering of this nano particles are happening which I have shown in this cartoon and if you calculate the nano particles these are typically from 1.5 to 3 nanometer size. So, in such uh, particle size we can isolate uh, iron particle nano alloys and if you can actually look at the phase diagram there are interesting things that we can uh, understand. One is there are several regions where um, the equilibrium phase diagram uh, indicates there are uh, magnetic phases as well as non magnetic phases. For example, in this case you have alpha Fe phase and this is the region where the um, alloy is magnetic and this is the region where alloy is magnetic and this is the region where alloy is magnetic. And there are regions where because of order disorder transformation you do not see magnetic phases. So, if there are no magnetic phases in between in this region then those regions should not show magneto resistance. So, in the next few graphs I will try to show you how critically the magnetic phases depend on magneto resistive response and how sonic chemically derived powders can influence the magnetic property and this we will see in the subsequent slides.